Welcome to our sermon series in the Book of Psalms, entitled, Songs of a Heart Set Free. Today we will be looking at Psalm 16 and thinking about what it means to enjoy God. And so, join us as we look at enjoying God. Keep me safe, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. As for the saints who are in the land, they are the glorious ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those will increase who run after other gods. I will not pour out their libations of blood or take up their names on my lips. Lord, you have assigned me my portion and my cup. You have made my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. The Westminster Shorter Catechism is a catechism written by the Westminster Assembly, a synod of English and Scottish theologians and laymen which met regularly from 1643 until 1649 during the English Civil War. The catechism was presented to the English Parliament in 1647 and approved by Parliament the following year in 1648. The Shorter Catechism was prepared primarily with children in view as a way to teach them the Christian faith. It is composed of a brief introduction and then 107 questions and answers. There is also a Baptist Catechism, often called Keech's Catechism, that is similar to the Westminster Shorter Catechism except for the sections on baptism. The first question and answer of both catechisms are very well known. The question reads, what is the chief end of man? The answer, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. You may have faith in God, you may believe in God and seek to serve him and live your life for him. But my question today is, do you enjoy God? In Psalm 16, we find David very much enjoying God. Even as he cries out to the Lord for help, it's very cl soon clear that he really enjoys God. The first four verses of Psalm 16 speak of protection. God watches over you. Where it says, Keep me safe, O God, for in you I take refuge. I said to the Lord, You are my Lord. Apart from you I have no good thing. As for the saints who are in the land, they are the glorious ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those will increase who run after other gods. I will not pour out their libations of blood or take up their names on my lips. A few weeks ago we looked at Psalm 11, which opened with the words, 
in the Lord I take refuge, which at the time I had you repeat, you may remember, I had you repeat that line with me, in the Lord I take refuge, in the Lord I take refuge. Well, here in Psalm 16, we find David coming back to that same idea as he says to the Lord, keep me safe, O God, for in you I take refuge. So let's repeat David's prayer in Psalm 16. Keep me safe, O God, for in you I take refuge. It is a prayer for protection. But the question is, protection from what? Verse 4 reveals that it may well be protection from the pressure to compromise his faith in God. It's a prayer for protection from what we now today call syncretism. By syncretism, I mean the merging of divergent religious faith and practices. It has always been a temptation for God's people, syncretism, going back to when the children of Israel first set up the golden calf at the foot of Mount Sinai. They cried out, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you up out of the land of Egypt. The Israelites tried to merge their belief in the God that Moses preached to them with some of the religious forms that they were used to from their time in Egypt. Syncretism was still a problem in the days in which David lived. David obviously felt pressure to give in and participate in worship rituals that were not consistent with faith in the one true God of Israel. So he, he took refuge in God and refused to go along with the crowd. I started out by saying that David enjoyed God, and we get a little bit of a taste of that in verse 2 where it says, I said to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. Do you sense David's heart? To David, the Lord God is his all in all. There's nothing as important to him as the Lord. And he speaks to the Lord as an intimate acquaintance. So he enjoys the Lord. He enjoys telling the Lord what the Lord means to him. It's very much a love relationship. But then then it's followed by verse 3 where he says, As for the saints who are in the land, they are the glorious ones in whom is all my delight. Now that's interesting. David's feelings for God's people are mirrored in his feelings for the Lord. You cannot delight in God and not delight in God's people. If you feel love for God, but not for his people, it's a warning sign. There is something wrong and it needs to be checked out. But a true follower of Jesus loves other followers of Jesus as well. So consider your feelings towards your brothers and sisters in Christ. The Lord himself said, By this all men will know you are my disciples if you have love one for another. The part of enjoying God is also enjoying our brothers and sisters in Christ. This is part of the support network that provides that safety and refuge for which David prayed. It's through other believers that we know that we're not alone and we can be encouraged through other believers not to give up but to keep going for the Lord and for one another. So part of our enjoying God is also enjoying our brothers and sisters in Jesus. That thought is followed immediately by that which we see in verse 4, which is a total contrast, where he says, The sorrows of those will increase who run after other gods. I will not pour out their libations of blood or take up their names on my lips. Quite unlike the other people that uh, look to whatever deities might be available to ease their problems and their burdens, David insists that those who depend on others in addition to God, well, their sorrows are actually just going to increase because their, their worship is not 
as they think it is. They think they can worship God and something else successfully and still have the blessing of God. But God is very jealous and he wants our affection completely. In verses five and six, we find the second thing that should prompt us to find enjoyment in God, and that is God's provision. God blesses you and me every day with various blessings that we need in our daily lives. Lord, you have assigned me my portion and my cup. You have made my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. Now God provides David with all he needs, whether it's food, possessions, or anything else. He recognizes that God is the one, is the giver of all these good things. The words portion and cup that he uses here are simply metaphors for God's provision for him. I like how the the updated NIV reads in this, you alone are my portion and my cup. And that really says it. And it's similar to the lesson that the Lord wanted to teach Aaron and the priests from the tribe of Levi. This is what God says to Aaron. You will have no inheritance in their land, nor will you have any share among them. I am your share and your inheritance among the Israelites. David felt very much the same way, that the Lord is his share and his inheritance. The Lord is his portion and cup. I hope you feel the same way as well, because apart from him, we have no good thing, as David said in verse 2. All of the blessings that we receive in our lives, all of the provision that we have, all of it comes from our Heavenly Father. He is the giver of all good things. In verse 6, there's another metaphor that's used about property and, and the, the border lines between property. David, of course, in doing so, in speaking about these boundary lines, he's not speaking about actual property. He's not speaking about a beautiful landscape that he might enjoy out of his window, but in general, looking at God's provision for his life. All he can say is that the lions have fallen for me in pleasant places. I have a delightful inheritance. Thirdly, in verse 7 and 8, we find that we have reason to find our enjoyment in God because of God's presence with us. Yes. God is with you. David says, I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. So David praises God, who he believes is with him. In verse 8 he said, because he is at my right hand. And be David believes that God is with him to, for a reason and uh, for a particular purpose and work, and that is to counsel me and to instruct me. And he says, well, even at nighttime. But if you find yourself awake at night, you could try going to BibleGateway.com. And of course, you know the audio Bible is, is, is available there in, in a few different versions um, and readers. There's some really good ones there. And, and just listen to it as you allow your mind to settle and your thoughts to relax and unwind while you listen to the scriptures being read to you. After saying all these things, these praiseworthy things about the Lord, about his, the way he counsels, the Lord counsels him and instructs him, the Lord always being before him and at his right hand, he says, I will not be shaken. God is a refuge you can count on to keep you safe. So God's provision is not only for this life, 
but for the next as well. Listen to these words. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. David is speaking about the afterlife, and he believes that God is waiting for him. God will be there in the afterlife, after death, as much as God is with him in the here and now. David has confidence in the way God has provided throughout his life, and that gives rise to the elation that he feels, where he says, my heart is glad, my tongue rejoices, and even my body can rest secure. And so he says, you will not abandon me to the grave. David is confident that his relationship with God will not end when he dies. There is something beyond the grave. That is a wonderful promise for us to take on board. And we depend on that. We are, that's our hope for the future, is that there is an afterlife, even as David was sure of this afterlife. The second half of verse 10 goes on to say, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. Now that word decay is literally and usually translated the pit, as, a, as in a, a, a hole that's dug in the ground for the depositing of a body. But in this case, it can include not only the, the pit that uh, you put the body in, but also the, the decomposition that will take place there when the body is buried. The corruption that happens to the, to the body at that point. As it says in Job chapter 17, verse 14, if I say to corruption, you are my father, and to the worm, my mother or my sister, well, what I'm, what I'm pointing out here is that there's this, this couplet. On one hand, you have corruption, who's the, who is his father, and the worm, who is his mother. Now, corruption, that word corruption there, is the same word that we find in, in Psalm 16, verse 10 decay or the pit in job 17 14 it's rendered corruption because opposite that word worm it takes on that idea of decomposition and corruption david certainly had a, a firm faith that his life is going to go on after death because even going beyond that he, he understands uh, that god has made known to him the path of life jesus said I have come that they might have life, and they might have it more abundantly. Jesus also said on another occasion, I am the way, or the path, the truth, and the life. And David says, God, you have made known to me the path of life. And that's a clear statement about his belief that life beyond the grave is in view, and that you will fill me with joy in your presence, when I see you face to face, God, David believed that his life would go on after death. He believed that God will give him that future joy in, in God's presence and eternal pleasures in heaven. And if your faith is in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, then these things are true for you as well. You have this promise you can have that assurance in your heart that the same God who provides for you in, in this life will provide for you in the next. Verse 10 raises an interesting question. Did David believe his body would not decompose after he dies? And I'll have to say, actually, probably not. David, like other people who wrote various portions of what we now call the Holy Scriptures in the Bible, they were speaking as prophets, and sometimes they were writing for someone else's benefit. And this is certainly the case in this, that the Holy Spirit intended something greater than what David had in view. And David was thinking about his own situation and, and his own life beyond the grave. 
and he was really encouraged about it and it gave him even more reason to enjoy the Lord and and just implicitly trust in him. About a thousand years later, one day, a man named Peter stands up and addresses thousands of Jewish people gathered in the city of Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. He preaches a message saying that even though these people had participated in the murder of their own Messiah by putting him on a cross, crucifying him, it was not possible for death to contain him. And so God raised him from the dead and that Jesus himself was now alive and is, of course, alive to this day. Peter preached the resurrection of Jesus and he appealed to these verses from Psalm 16 as proof as a prediction of the resurrection of Jesus. In Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 24, Peter says this, God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will live in hope. Because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. And then Peter goes on to say, after having quoted from Psalm 16, verses 8 through 11, Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. The Holy One spoken of in Psalm 16, verse 10, is none other than Jesus our Lord, God's Holy One, God's chosen Messiah. And God did not allow him to see decay because he rose again from the dead on the third day and is alive today. And this is, this is the message of the gospel of Jesus. Without the resurrection, we do not have a message. It's not enough that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. If Jesus is still dead, then what life can we look forward to? If he's not alive, how can we say that we will be made alive? No, but because Jesus rose from the dead, we too one day will rise from the dead. In fact, all people in all places, whether you are a believer in Jesus Christ or not, will rise from the dead to stand before God. Both the just person and the unjust will stand before God one day in the day of judgment. For us who believe in the Lord Jesus, who have our faith in him, it is a hope that gives us joy and pleases us because we know that there are eternal pleasures waiting for us as God is there waiting to receive us. But for those who do not believe in the Lord Jesus, well, they, like, they try not to think about these things, about the day of judgment and about the possibility of life after death. They like People like to think that there is nothing after that. It, it eases their conscience a little bit to not think that there is any life after death because they don't want to have to face the righteous judgment of their Creator. But if you would only put your faith in the Lord Jesus, all will be well. The day of judgment can be a prospect that you can look to with, yes, a seriousness about you, but also knowing that God has accepted you not on the basis of what good you do, but on the basis of the merits of Jesus Christ, his Son, 
who died for you. And so your good deeds or failure to do good deeds are not a deal breaker in God's sight. God is a God of grace, and it's because of his grace, his kindness to us and his love that he sent Jesus to die on the cross for you and me. But Jesus had to rise from death, and that's what Psalm 16 prophesies, that the Messiah will not stay dead. He will rise from the dead a thousand years before the event happened. Not only did the Apostle Peter preach like this, using Psalm 16, the Apostle Paul also used the same passage of Scripture in his preaching about the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. In Acts chapter 13, the fact that God raised him from the dead never to decay is stated in these words, I will give you the holy and sure blessings promised to David, so it is stated elsewhere, you will not let your Holy One see decay. For when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep, that is, he died. He was buried with his fathers, and his body decayed. But the one whom God raised from the dead did not see decay. And so Paul preaches the resurrection of Jesus from Psalm 16, verse 10. See, the Holy Spirit led David in his choice of words to speak about God's future Holy One, the Messiah, Jesus our Lord. In conclusion, let's review our four reasons for enjoying God. One, protection in verses one to four which means that God watches over you. And because God watches over you, you should trust in him and stay safe. The second reason we can enjoy God is because of his provision in verse five and six. God blesses you daily. And that calls upon us to take note of his blessings on your lot in our life every day and to give thanks. The third reason for enjoying God is because of his presence with us in verse seven and eight. God is with you. And so you can praise him for doing that as, as he leads you in your life. He is with you to counsel you and instruct you. Fourthly, we can enjoy God because of his promise to us. In verse nine through 11, God awaits your arrival one day in heaven. God waits for you to trust in him as well. And I would say to, to you, if you have not trusted in him, do so, so that you can have assurance in your heart that God is awaiting your arrival in heaven with a smile on his face. And having faith in him, you can be happy and go forward in this life as long as God gives you breath. You can go forward with hope in your heart and a spring in your step. Enjoy God. What is the chief end of man and woman and child? Our chief end is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have called us to enjoy you as we place our faith in you, as we call out to you and trust in you, as we take you to be our refuge You protect us, you provide for us, you allow your presence to be with us, and you promise us 
that where you go, we will be also. You promise us that there is a room for us in your house and that Jesus will come one day to take us to be with him. Thank you so much for all of your blessings to us, all these reasons and more that you give for us to enjoy you. You are so kind to us, so good to us. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.